You know, if you have allergies, you go to an allergist, you know, if you have some, uh, let's see a good one, something going on with your ear, nose or throat. Amazingly, you go to an ear, nose or throat guy. So of course, if you have something wrong with your feet, you go to a podiatrist. What if that's the dumbest thing you could possibly do? We're going to find out by talking to a podiatrist. So (laughs) this is going to be a lot of fun on today's episode of the Movement Movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body. Starting feet first, because those things are your foundation. You know, Uh, we break down the propaganda, the mythology, and sometimes the flat out lies you've been told about what it takes to run or walk or hike or play or dance or do yoga or CrossFit, whatever it is you like to do. And to do that enjoyably and efficiently and effectively. And did I say enjoyably? Trick question, because I know I did, because that's the most important part. Look, if you're not having fun, do something different till you are, because you're not going to keep it up anyway if you're not having a good time. I am Stephen Sashin from ZeroShoes.com, your host of the Movement Movement podcast, and we call it the Movement Movement, because we, that includes you, it's easy, it's free, don't worry about it, relax. Uh, We're creating a movement about natural movement, letting your body do what it's made to do, because that can be better for you. And the way you can participate, uh, the movement part, the part that you're involved in is go check out our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. There's nothing you need to do to join. You can opt in and get emails about upcoming episodes. You can see on, listen to the previous episodes. You can find all the places you can grab the podcast or find us on social media, et cetera, et cetera. In short, you know what to do, like, and thumbs up and share, et cetera. If you want to be part of the tribe, just subscribe. So let's get into it. Paul, it is a pleasure having you here. Um, I know you heard my wacky intro. Why don't you tell people who you are and what you do? Thanks for having me here, mate. So I'm a podiatrist, um, <laughs> like you mentioned. <laughs> I've somehow coined the term the barefoot podiatrist many years ago, and I've run with it. So essentially, yeah, I'm a podiatrist who specializes in barefoot rehab or getting people back to a like a barefoot state, a natural state in short. And so Paul Thompson, um, you didn't even say that part. So Paul, um, people can probably tell from your accent, you're from Texas. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Texas? No, it's more um, (laughs) kind of Southeast Asia. It's Australia. Yeah. So thank you for doing this at this. What time is it where you are now? We're running it around 8 a.m. Oh, okay. Not so bad. If you were getting up at four in the morning, I would thank you for fusely, but 8 a.m. That's I've been up for hours by that point. So, <laughs> you know, the big question that I want to ask is talk to me about sort of traditional podiatric training. What do people learn when they're becoming podiatrists about feet and more specifically about natural movement? Or is that just not even part of the curriculum? Yeah. So I, was, I did my uni training around 15 years ago, I want to say. And back then, natural movement wasn't a thing. So Podiatry training was, we learned about the feet and <laughs> some, some muscles in the feet, some bones in the feet. But I'm just thinking it's like, it's sort of like when you get on an airplane and they say, welcome to, you know, so-and-so to Los Angeles. You go, oh crap, I'm on the wrong plane. I wonder if there are people <laughs> who went to, you know, podiatry school. It's like, we're going to be talking about the feet. Feet. Oh my God. I thought this was going to be proctology school. So <laughs> <laughs> funnily enough, the first half year of the university degree, there was nothing to do with feet. It was how to talk to people, like things you can and can't say to a patient. It was really broad kind of, like, like I walked into the first you know, few classes and that's what I thought. I was like, am I, am I the right school? Like, what, what, uh, when do we now, learn about feet? Now I'm dying, dying to know what things can you not say to a patient? Well, it's probably changed now, but yeah, back that. then it was, it was common sense stuff. You know, it was just, how to literally, I think it was just that common sense for people that didn't have common sense of, you know, not calling people fat, not you know, just using words like the, the politically correct terms, you know, like you couldn't say your feet are sore because you're fat. You had to say, well, you know, there could be some, I can't remember that was a long time ago, but it was quite a funny semester, I must admit. Oh, um I clearly took a lot away from it. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned that though. So I got a degree in film and yeah. in, they make you take an acting class. And the first semester of the acting class is mostly just embarrassing yourself in front of your classmates. And yeah. the second semester is learning what not to say to actors. Like, don't say to an actor. Can you do that again, but be happier? Because that makes actors <laughs> want to punch you in the face. So uh, I guess, you know, the beginning of podiatric training in film school, very similar, learning what not to say to your clients. Well, I guess everyone's so scared of being sued or punched in the face that 
that I guess they have to teach that now because maybe too many podiatrists were getting punched in the face. I don't know. I haven't looked into that, but that's a, that's so, yeah. A, so, <laughs> so then since they weren't talking, teaching about natural movement, what were they teaching was all just, I mean, I, I can't even imagine what it was like. And eventually we're obviously going to get to the transition from you mm. know, what you did to become now the barefoot podiatrist. So in Australia, podiatrists are slightly different to America. We're not surgeons. In America, we're more like physical therapists or allied health is our terminology here. So podiatry school has two main kind of branches. There's the general kind of podiatry, like skin, nail kind of conditions that we treat in your toenails or the gunky stuff that people grow on their skin. So that's kind of a big part of it. And then we do biomechanics. Now, biomechanics is kind of the movement side of podiatry, which is, you know, why most um, podiatrists probably get into podiatry, you know, wanting to be a sports podiatrist and do all the, the cool things you think is going to come along with that with sporting teams and the likes. Now, biomechanics training, you know, it was cool. We learned a lot about, um, we're really well trained actually in biomechanics and how the body moves and, you know, how muscles work with joints and, and you know, tendons and like we kind of learn all that stuff, but all roads lead to an orthotic. So we did one, maybe two, could be wrong, but there was no more than two classes on exercises. And the lady who ran the exercise component, like magician, she's magic. She's like, she knew her stuff. And at the time, a lot of my peers, we kind of didn't take what she was saying seriously because a lot of the other academics in the degree kind of almost put it down a bit, you know, not not bad-mouthing her, but almost like, well, you know, it's good to know some of that stuff, but really here's the devices you're going to be using to fix people. So it was kind of almost shoved to the side a lot. And it wasn't until years later that I actually reached out to her again and went, wow, like, thank you. Some of that stuff's actually clicked and I'm now down this rabbit hole um, and kind of pretty much doing what you were telling us to do back then full time. <laughs> like, what was her response? Because I can imagine one of two. I mean, I can imagine one would be, wow, because I was aware that, you know, people were completely dismissing what I was saying, but I was, but I knew that, you know, maybe one day, or I mean, it's sort of like I talked to Phil Maffetone, who don't know, he's a very well known uh, running coach, distance coach, and he's been talking about minimalist footwear and barefoot running since the 80s. And when I became friendly with him 10, 12 years ago, I said, do you feel like, vindicated that people have caught up to you or mad that it took this long? He goes, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, that's pretty much what she said. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she ended up getting me at this point, I was doing what I've been doing for a while of the, the barefoot stuff. And she actually got me to go up and teach at the uni, a couple of workshops to kind of see what I was doing and, and sort of try and get that message through to some of the fourth year students that were about to graduate. And you know, to answer kind of your earlier question of like, has that curriculum changed and more natural movement now? It hasn't. So I went into to teach this workshop. So I was kind of there all day teaching tutorials and workshops to these fourth years, running them through kind of the, the basics of just natural movement and, and kind of why we need to look at, you know, other paradigms as well to, to fix the same problems and just come at it from a different angle. And most of the questions pretty much all of the questions were, well, how does this, you know, work with an orthotic, you know, but the research says something to do with an orthotic. Like they really tried to, to pull me down. These were fourth year students about to graduate. And, you know, a lot of them by the end of the day were, were kind of opening up and seeing that there was merit in trying to fix the problem, not just band-aid the problem, but, you know, that's four years of conditioning of, putting every patient into a supportive shoe, you know, essentially an orthotic um, and then getting them on that subscription for orthotics for their lifetime. I have a friend who was studying to be a physical therapist who, when they got into the section about feet, called me and said, did you know the guy who came up with orthotics was a chiropractor who just made up the idea of positioning the foot in a particular way with no evidence behind it? I said, uh, in fact, I actually did know that one. Uh, she goes, yeah, that's kind of shocking, don't you think? I'm like, yes, it is. Um, but what people realized is that you could sell this product year after year after year after year. 
um, mm-hmm. by doing so. How do you think there? I mean, obviously, people don't know the history of orthotics, and the the original idea actually was like a cast for your arm if you broke your arm, you know, just a temporary measure to allow some tissue to heal, but not something you're supposed to wear all day, every day. Um, so that combination of not knowing the history of it and seeing the monetary potential, how much do you think that was just influencing the way people were thinking from day one? I've always said if if we weren't allowed to prescribe orthotics, so if my job was to say, yeah, you need an orthotic, you know, I'll write the prescription, but I make no money from that. I reckon we would see like a gazillionth of a percent of like what's out there now <laughs> in orthotics. You know, it's almost like it's become an industry. And unfortunately, that's the world. You know, you go to a optometrist, they kind of want to sell your glasses because that's how they make their money. Yeah. You know, like you get a, a dentist, they kind of want to put you in braces or something like that's. It's kind of a bit of a broken system, I feel. And I know it's the way it works and it's like, I'm not trying to change the world, but like it is a broken system when you're going to the person who is trying to tell you you need something, but also takes the money Conflict from that. Yeah. It's kind of like a used car salesman, right? They're going to tell you it's what you need, that car, and take the money, even though they know when you drive up the road, it's going to break down. Like Here, there is a conflict of interest. Let's piss people off. So I, I like, <laughs> so I like, have we not already? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I like that you brought up the glasses analogy because I, when I found out that I needed glasses, which I'm not wearing because I'm fine at computer distance, I had a friend who was an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. I can't remember which, doesn't matter. Anyway, um, and so I, I need a pair of glasses. And I said, can you, you know, get me a deal on these frames that I'm looking for? He goes, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, here's call my office and just tell them that just uh, I sent you and just to give you our price. And so these frames I was looking at retail, Five hundred dollars. Guess what the guess what his cost was, and there's still profit built into that. Guess what his cost was on a five hundred dollar pair of glasses? Two fifty. Seventy dollars. Oh <laughs> yeah. So let's piss people off on the orthotic side. So uh, the average orthotic cost X, and what is it? Or it's sold to the patient for X. What's a practitioner charge or getting? So it's changing a lot currently, supposedly because of all the shortages in people oh, yeah. <laughs> and and supplies and things but it no, depends in, where you in, are in a, so. in, a norm, in a normal world so roughly let's say a cheap pair of orthotics in more rural well let's go to sydney so in sydney prices up there you're looking at around 800 bucks for a pair of orthotics in sydney oh my god okay more regional maybe closer to you know five six hundred cost on that could be anywhere from 200 to 300, depending on the lab you use. Wow. And even that, I mean, I, I literally can't imagine how much money the lab is making. Well, the lab would be killing it. Uh, <laughs> if you, well, you know, like the materials aren't yeah. absurd. Orthotics are, so here's the other thing, right? With orthotics, it just drives me nuts. Old school orthotics, yes, I could see value in paying 500 bucks for an orthotic. They're handmade from go to woe. They're you know, you you manually mold the the cast to get that mold. So the practitioner is kind of you know doing something and trying to get the right position, and they they know what they're trying to create with their hand. That goes to a lab or you know old school. The podiatrist would make it in house, and it was all handmade. These days, it's printed. Most of them are printed. I even know some labs that have a it's scanned. You scan the foot, and when it goes to their lab, the computer system picks the closest template to that foot. So it's not even 100% custom. It'll go, well, that foot has, you know, this size and this width and that kind of deep of an arch from the scan. Our closest template to that is template C. This is printed out. They throw the cover on, send it to the podiatrist. The podiatrist might have to make a few modifications in, you know, just grinding a few bits and pieces to make it feel more comfortable when it hits your foot. That's it. So now, and this is where I get really cranky with podiatrists, you know, because back in the day, I believe I believe orthotics have a place. You know, it's like saying plaster cast for your arm don't have a place. Like right. if you have an injured foot, yeah, there are times structurally or whatever that it can be a really good thing. You know, absolutely. Um, I still prescribe them every now and then for for certain patients. It's just there is a time and place if done well. Right now, as podiatrists, we held you know a really good way of doing it. We we were the masters in orthotics, right? Since it's become this whole scan technology and 
uh, did I say scan or scam? Anyway, scan technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I slipped up there. I appreciate um, it. <laughs> since we started scanning the foot, it's now opened the door to every man and their dog to try to sell orthotics. Right. I know a physio up um, north of us here advertises that, you know, why go to podiatrists? You can get this all in house, one stop shop. And we use the same technology and orthotics that your local podiatrist does. And he's not lying. It's just like he might have a different way of prescribing and maybe doesn't understand how podiatrists prescribe, but it's true. He's using the same software, the same scanning device, the same lab. So it's the same orthotic. He's charging a little bit less and incorporating that into some rehab with, you know, his physical therapy. And why wouldn't you go there? Right. You know I mean, like as a consumer, it's sort of, so yeah, I feel like we've shot ourselves in the foot. Yeah. Hence why years ago I started jumping into this barefoot thing and like it made more sense to me and I wanted to fix people. I wanted to get off that that kind of bandwagon of, of fighting with other industries, um, with my own industry. And were you yeah. were you concerned if you dropped the incessant prescription of orthotics that it was gonna dramatically affect your income? Um, well, yeah, but even through university, I I didn't like orthotics. I had this really kind of love-hate relationship with them. I could see there was a, a time and place and I understood, you know, that through uni there was this competition in-house that used to take place amongst the students. It was kind of driven by one of the main lecturers who owns an orthotic lab. So all the orthotics from the university went to his lab, right? He was one of the teachers at the, the uni. Now, we had to make one or two pairs a year ourselves as part of our degree, like physically make them from scratch. The rest you could prescribe through the, you know, the lab. So there was this kind of, you know, it wasn't an official award. It was a in-house kind of, you know, joke award that it would, you know, we would see who would make the most orthotics that year, you know, who was the the orthotic guru. And I just didn't like it. I I would prescribe my minimum that I had to do. And, you know, people would be like, why are you casting them up? Cast them up. It was like the the terms that, you know, you would cast the foot to, to get the mold right. for the orthotic. You know, why don't you cast them up? Like, well, I don't need to. <laughs> but you're only on, you know, X amount. Like it became this kind of in-house joke which I didn't think was that funny. Years later, running into people, you know, that's all they talked about. Oh, we're turning over about X amount of orthotics a week. And, well, is that really that cool? Like I'm turning over X amount of patients a week and, you know, rehabilitating X amount of patients. I feel like that's a cooler conversation rather than, you know, talking about how many devices you've prescribed. So that kind of turned me off it a lot to begin with, that whole competitive side of it. And it made it feel to me like, I wasn't doing justice to the industry. And that's when I started looking into fixing myself and getting myself out of the orthotics I was in because that's the only way I could keep up my numbers with everyone else was to keep prescribing myself some because <laughs> I felt bad giving them to patients. And when I started fixing myself, that's when I kind of stumbled across just a whole new world of information and mentors started popping out of the woodwork um, that I started coming across. And they were, you know, some, the, my main one was a chiropractor actually really got me looking at joint movement and then you know getting that foot moving and mobile again and from there i just couldn't look back you know it was kind of like when your eyes open you're like damn like you know now i can't sort of go back and into that world so you know the money side of it yes it's a concern but it's not why i got into podiatry you know well, it also occurs to me if you're not prescribing orthotics all the time, you and and if you are genuinely trying to rehabilitate someone, that's a whole different kind of business building that one has to do because you're not just mm. getting them in and keeping them in year after year with a new prescription every year. So that's a, a completely different way of thinking about how you're building a practice, I imagine. Yeah. And my, I guess my downside is I try and get rid of those patients too. So you know, I know some physical therapists locally that will do exercises, but it's almost like they try and keep people on that that wheel of keeping them as long as they can doing exercises in-house. Um, for me, I really want to try and empower the individual and, and teach them how to do more of this stuff themselves. I want to be as um, least hands-on as I can with people is kind of how I approach um, rehabilitation. If we can, you know, I obviously help people and do hands-on stuff mobilizing feed and strength work and manual therapy where we need to. But my approach and my kind of philosophy, I guess, is if we can empower that person to understand what's happening with their own body, 
then they can start looking after themselves and making better choices to fix their own feet or at least manage their own feet long term. They're not going to rely on me, which from a business point of view is probably terrible, but it helps me sleep at night. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel any better, we've had a number of people say the fact that you have a 5,000 mile sole warranty is really st- on your shoes is really stupid. <laughs> yeah. Replacing shoes more often, I go, no, I want to have people have a better product and a better experience. Um, yeah, so right. yeah, same idea. I, I mean, I want to get back into your story about the transition, sort of what you discovered mm-hmm. and what that transition was. But before we go there, um, I had two questions that popped into my mind. One is, um, I imagine some people come to you and they really are looking to be taken care of rather than having to take responsibility for themselves. Do you encounter that? And if so, you know, how do you handle that? Um, I do. So I think... Not my thing. I know, like a lot of people are still. We've been conditioned, right? As humans in this society we live in at this time on Earth, to be looked after. If we feel sick, we go to the doctor. We expect that doctor to give us something to make us better. If it doesn't make us better, we go back and they give us something else. Like we don't take any responsibility for our own health anymore. And that's not just with the doctor. That's everything. Yeah. You know, like if you want to get fit you kind of join the gym hoping that gym is going to make you fit. Like you wouldn't just, yeah, not that you can still take responsibility at the gym, but do you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. we kind of want that quick fix and, and hoping that that thing that we're purchasing is going to make us better in some way. So I get it every day. Like most people come in here wanting to know how I'm going to fix them. And, you know, through educating and you kind of pick up on that vibe as well through talking to people, how much they're going to do on their own. I tend to find the people that really don't want to take any responsibility don't tend to hang around long um, and not in a bad way. They're normally very polite and, and kind of will just say, look, I don't think this is for me, this barefoot kind of exercise approach. I really want to thought this is something you can help me with or, you know, can you, can you send me someone's way if they're local I I still want to help people. So if they're local, sometimes I'll just do that to help them get out of pain and get them back into life. If they're not local, I do a lot of Zoom um, patients, then, you know, I'll try and source someone locally for them to to help with that. But like you can only help someone that wants to be helped. Yeah. You know, so I don't I don't take it to heart anymore. It's just, you know, once you educate someone, I still feel like if you've like quite quite often what happens, I've had people that have, you know, begged me for orthotics because they just but didn't have time to do the exercises or whatever. Normally it's like two, three years later, I'll see them again. Huh. Oh, remember, remember what you said? Like these are thought kind of worn out. Like they haven't been that comfortable. Like I kind of can't wear the shoes I want to wear and this and that. Is that still an option to, you know, look at those exercises? And normally by that stage they're ready and they actually go at it health for leather and, and do really well. So I still feel like even the people that aren't quite ready at the time, just by sinking that seed in and, and educating a little bit, it's still there. And yeah, for yeah. most of them, at some point, they're going to go, oh, you know what, this method isn't working. I really want to try a different approach. And I'm seeing more and more of that now after years and years of talking about this. Well, I'm going to tell you where this is going. So the first thing I want to do next is hear about what it was like when you made this transition to what you're now thinking of as the barefoot podiatrist, what that means. And then the second thing I'd like you to talk about, I know you can't prescribe just kind of a generic protocol, but if somebody were going to come see you, what are the kind of things that they end up doing or walking out then having to do just so they get a sense of what's doable? And I guess maybe there's a third thing, which is for people who are not seeing you privately yet, um, anything that you could that you would recommend that people do to just kind of take this first step, pun intended, in t- with natural movement and foot health. So that's your transition what it's like when people come to see you and what you want to give someone to pun intended walk away with. I'll try and remember all three of those, by the way. Please do. I've already forgotten the first one. I had to say all three of them, otherwise I'd forget. So, because that's the way my brain works. Wait, I'm going to do you, patient, and a call to action. All right. Now I know what that means. Okay. You're first. You first. So, with the transition from, you mean just like, how has that looked? Yeah. No, like what happened, you know, what was the, what did you do? What was the thing that was that kind of revelatory? I mean, like for Irene Davis, who we've talked with on the podcast and talked about um, who was teaching people how to make orthotics. She was at the university of Delaware and then suddenly realized 
wait, you know, when people come in as a, to see us as physical therapists, we want them to move as much as possible pain-free, but then we're immobilizing their foot. What? That doesn't make sense. And that led her to start investigating. And that led her to becoming the number one researcher on minimalist footwear in the world. What was, you know, I guess the easiest way to put it is what's your version of that story? So for me, I was actually, I had been in orthotics, like I said, for, for years and years, you know, I had a ACL um, torn years ago through a snowboarding thing <laughs> that happened. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. It's still a bit raw. Because um, <laughs> I tried snowboarding when there was no snow and that didn't work out very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a knee issue, constant issues with my Achilles and my plantar fascia forever, you know, almost since a kid. I was in orthotics as a kid and went years without them as a podiatrist, started back down that road, had shoe reps in every other week, giving us shoes. You know, that's what they do to try and get us to sell their shoes, which is fine. But I tried everything and just, I was always in pain. I was never comfortable. And it wasn't until my elder son had been born and we're over in Hawaii um, and I was walking on the beach with him, you know, him in my arm, and I just started getting that pain in my, my foot again. I was just like, oh. And I remember just sort of looking at him. Here I am in like one of the most beautiful spots in the world, you know, with this brand new little baby thinking I'm going to be this great dad that's going to be chasing this kid in a few years and, and here I was with a sore heel as a podiatrist, which is kind of like, really? And at that point, I was like, something needs to change. Like, the orthotics, the shoes haven't worked. Like, I'm missing something here. Like, how can I not even fix my own feet when I'm a podiatrist? And, I, you know, here I am trying to help other people's feet um, day in, day out with the same issue. And I went down this rabbit hole then, researching, reading, and just trying different things on myself. I was just patient zero, just... But first, I tried minimalist shoes for me, which back then, I think I started with Nike Free was like the first one was which, obviously no. Not even a minimal shoe, but that's the way it was positioned. It was more minimal than what was around at the time. It was more flexible. I mean, more flexible, yeah. Well, it had a, a smaller drop as well. A than, little, yeah, a little bit. I mean, it still had a big flared heel, but I remember when I got a pair of those, it was just miraculous how much I could feel because the sole articulated more. Mm. That was really cool, but it was still, you know, pretty built up and all the rest. But that one thing of just, you know, having more, especially laterally, more flexibility laterally was, I remember mm. really walking down the street and being kind of amazed by that. Well, it was the same. So it didn't fix my feet. Right. Definitely. Right. But that feeling of like, well, this shoe moves how I like, you know, I, I'm, I surf, you know, so I'm always on the beach barefoot anyway. And I like that feeling in my feet moving. It's just that it was causing a lot of pain before. So that kind of just got me interested in like, well, what is this kind of whole flexible, you know, Nike free thing that they're kind of playing with? There must be something behind this if Nike's going down this road at that point is what I thought. Um, and the more I dug, I just, I realized, yeah, well, I haven't been locking my foot up. There's all these joints in there and joints are meant to move. Um, half the muscles in my feet were weak as all hell and I'd never really used them. My balance was shocking. You know, here I am like a late twenties, early thirties surfer, snowboarder and my balance stuff to like, how does that happen? Um, and the more I just dug into things and started asking questions, people I knew and they put me onto someone else and it just kind of took years and years, but eventually my knee pain went away. My, and it wasn't that long actually, but like my knee pain went away. My knee started moving like it used to, my balance improved, my foot pain disappeared, and I was able to run around like with my child at the time a lot more freely and happily. And and it just I couldn't go back. So it was just this whirlwind of learning and and then with patients asking me like what I was doing, what were these, you know, different shoes I was wearing and whatever. It then I wanted to post stuff about it. So at the time Instagram was a platform and Facebook that um, I was kind of just on for private stuff and I just started posting stuff on the clinic page for patients to saying, well, look, here's some exercises. Like, you know, I didn't really have any fancy software at the time. So that was a way of me just going, look, you know, I've put some of these online, just jump on this page and have a look and you can do these exercises. You know, that's what I want you to do. And it kind of started to grow and people in my industry started to get wind of what I was talking about, anti-orthotic <laughs> and pro-exercise, right? And I got smashed. I had one of the biggest orthotic labs in Australia ring me and pretty much like tell me I'm going to shut my career down. I had people from the board um, also tell me to watch what I was saying. 
that I, you know, that there's people from the top of the podiatry board seeing what I'm doing and talking about and that I could be in breach of, you know, certain things. Like, and at that point, I was kind of remember going home, my wife just going, like, I'm getting smashed. Like, this is, I was getting really worried, you know, here I am yeah. with my little business and yeah. it's not that big either now, but it's just, you know, I'm little kind of me and my little band, we're just doing our thing and I was just posting some stuff that I believed in. It was nothing too out there. And here I am getting getting pumped. And I thought at that moment, well, I either, you know, step back and just kind of not put this out there, which I almost did. And then I thought, well, if I'm pissing people off, but they shouldn't be worried about me. Like, <laughs> who am I? I was no one. I am no one. You know, like I'm a little podiatrist here with no followers. Like what are they worried about? And then just got my back up and I went harder <laughs> and posted more and started speaking more publicly, like public speaking at events. And eventually a lot of the naysayers kind of just, you know, fell off. But this kind of tribe started to follow and and it's kind of grown to where it is now to the point that I did get to speak at the uni, you know, I've I've spoken at lots of different events with the most being around 700 people at this wellness event down in Melbourne a few years ago. Like, so it's, I'm glad I took that plunge. And, you know, as much as people didn't want me to put this information out there, it felt right and it felt like I needed to do so. And that's how it grew. And, and now that's what I do. <laughs> I love it. And so when someone comes to see you, this is the second part, what's that experience like? What do you do to kind of evaluate what's going on? What, I mean, what's the conversation like about, the introduction about natural movement and exercise and strength rather than getting posted with an orthotic? So I get two types of patients generally, either people that know what I'm about and are already all for it. Yeah. They've seen it online. Um, a lot of those people have already bounced around, you know, multiple podiatrists, physical therapists, potentially chiropractors. They've had a lot of different treatments and that used to scare me. They're like, oh, like they've tried everything. What am I going to do? You know, like, what else? Can, what can I possibly do? Or I get people that just have no idea. They're here because they've got a sore foot and they go to the podiatrist. And I find they're actually harder because you need to educate and really explain more about what's going on. The people that somewhat get it and have tried everything, they're ready. They want that fix. Yeah. Now, often when people come in with pain, they're kind of surprised when I'm not that interested in the pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll want to talk about the pain for forever. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's cool. Like we can give that a name if you want, but I want to see how you're moving. So we do a full functional assessment. I want to see how that person's moving, what their foot is doing with the rest of their body, how the hips are moving, you know, just lots of different movements, stepping up, stepping down, squatting, um, lunging, single leg, you know, partial squats, lots of different movements depending on their age and ability. But I want to see as many movements as I can to work out where the breakdown or where the dysfunction is in these movement patterns. Now, what I've found is a lot of these injuries I see that are chronic, they're not because you've done something silly and injured it. You know, you've tripped down a gutter, you know, you've sprained your ankle. Like right. that's a different sort of treatment, right? These ones that are these foot pains, these knee pains, these back pains, hip pains that have been there for years and nothing seems to work, that's biomechanics. That's the way you're moving and loading that tissue incorrectly and it gets sore, it gets burnt out and sore. So, I assess how people move and then generally once I've done all that, it starts to make sense to them when I start saying things like, you know, your, your foot's doing this, your hip's not doing this when you're walking, which is loading this tissue that is now the breaking point, which is why you've got pain. But I can sit here and treat your pain all day like you've had for the last, you know, 6, 12 months at other places. We're not going to get anywhere. We need to change how you move. And that normally clicks and they kind of get that and can see, you know, it's common sense once you see it. And from there, we'll either do manual therapy to work on some of the pain because if they're in pain, it can be hard to sometimes sure. fix movement anyway. But a lot of the stuff I do is exercise-based, but it's neuromuscular exercise-based. So not so much strengthening um, or flexibility, even though there is some of that in there, it's more drills to try and get the brain to use those patterns again. So you're kind of getting, you know, it's like if you have a really strong bicep, but your hand doesn't work, you're not picking anything up. So it's getting that hand and that arm to actually work together again, get your brain to, to know when to grip, when to let go, so that you can actually pick up a bag or whatever. The foot's the same. We want 
those muscles, tendons, ligaments, nerves to start feeling again, to start getting some input for the brain to actually start lighting up those areas, but in a sequence that it works together. It's not just on and kind of like jammed on and then it becomes another problem. It comes on and off and moves and adapts to the terrain under people. Um, so it's really simple type of movements, but it works. No, <laughs> Once that brain connects, you know, then it becomes more subconscious pattern. I love I love that you uh, use the word brain a hundred times because this is the thing that people forget is that's the thing that's controlling the movement, but there's also a feedback loop from the muscular skeletal system, and you got to you know make one of them shift and the other is going to kind of go oh so mm. the relationship between this I remember the first time I met a guy named Thomas Hanna who uh, he brought Feldenkrais work to America and I had a session with him and he got my body to move. Basically my arm had been kind of locked in place, gymnastics injuries, and he got my arm to move in a way that it hadn't moved in years, somewhat passively, but I could feel my brain going, Oh, that, Oh, right. I forgot I could do that. And that was what, that was all it needed. Yeah. And that's the problem, right? Like when I started my own personal rehab kind of mission, for me, it was all about strength and mobility, right? Right. It was like, well, it'll make my feet stronger and more mobile. But like, why wouldn't I be right? You know, that's kind of yeah. personal training 101. Yeah. And, you know, it helped. It definitely helped. But it didn't change how I moved. It didn't change right. how I walked. And it wasn't until I put the ego aside, went, all right, <laughs> I'm not going to try and get stronger or go for maximum range of motion without control. I'm going to learn how to control these movements within the range I've got and then increase that range with control because most of the issues i see it's people in positions without control mm. right that's when we get hurt got it well you know this whole over pronation thing is there such thing as over pronation like look at some of the islanders they've got the flattest feet in the world and don't get injured you know but then we have people who might have flat feet and are full of pain it's how much control you've got in those positions same as with your shoulder right you get yeah. people that can get in these crazy weird positions for one person, they can control that movement. They've got the strength, the mobility, but the control, the motor control to maintain that position safely, and they're fine. Yeah. Someone else gets in that position, blows their whole shoulder out, and they're in for surgery or something, you know? So it's, for me now, I realize the control piece is a huge, huge part of what we need to do to rehabilitate people. And that's where things like your shoes play a huge role. It lets people start to control those movements like, yes, there's proprioception and strengthening and all these great things that we do need for healthy movement, but it allows the brain to start using its own infrastructure to control that movement, not be thrown into these whipping effects with those big chunky heels or, you know, motion control. We don't want to control motion, but we do, but yeah. not from an external device. We want to be able to do that from within. But like you just mentioned before, it starts at the brain. If our brain doesn't know how to control those movements, right. we're going to get injured. So that's the perfect segue for if we want to give people an experience, something to try, something to play with on their own, um, mm -hmm. as we kind of wrap up our conversation, what would you like to give them as a something to take away? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, look, it's hard because there is a lot of um, variables based on people's uh, hey, look, it, and it Well, it occurs to me, I'm not even necessarily suggesting, I mean, when I thought to ask the question, I was thinking, what movement thing might we want to share? I'm willing to you know, go somewhere else where the thing to do would be read the following paper, read the following book, talk to the following person. I mean, wherever you can think to go for what a, a next think, step might be for someone. I think next step is, um, and look, it depends where you are in your journey as well. You know, like if you haven't been out of a traditional shoot, like that's where you're still at, then you want to take it a little bit easier you know, it can be as simple as getting your old shoes off, going for a walk on the grass, but simple things to reconnect. Let's just go with feet. Like typically in a consult um, or working one-on-one -on -one with someone, I'm working on foot, hip, and breath as a connection piece. We're trying to get all three working together for the most part, plus other things, but that's kind of the key points that I tend to try and get that control over. So you could start with your feet with simple things like toe yoga, you know, be toe up, little toes down, be toe back down, little toes up and switching. If you've been in, I mean, if you're a barefooter, then that's probably going to be quite easy if you've you know, been out of shoes and your feet are, have more of that connection. But for someone with not very much connection to their feet, 
that simple act of just trying to control movement of the toes again can be huge. Like people freak out that they can't do that and need to use their hands to kind of just get that motion going again. Um, short foot is another exercise that's got a, quite a bit of you know research behind it as to whether it helps functionally or not. Who knows? But it is definitely another one that just starts to get that connection piece of trying to get your brain to use some of these muscles without load. Is literally just trying to get your the arch of your foot to contract. So you're kind of squeezing the, the metatarsals or the ball of your foot back towards your heel to activate some of those intrinsics. That can be a nice one to um, start with as well. But otherwise, you know, if you're more progressed in your journey, single leg work, like walking, running, like there's a lot of movements we do that we're on one leg. Yeah. And for a lot of people, we don't have stability and control on one leg. So lots of single leg work on um, balance beams, balance pads on the flat ground, Yeah, you know, take away the ego. I find a lot of people, uh, especially around here, a lot of surfers, they want to get on the, the BOSU ball and stand there and, you know, be doing these crazy movements. And it's like, cool, that's, that's really impressive. Can you just stand on one leg on the ground for me? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And they can't, <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, you've trained yourself to stand on these weird objects, which is great, but you know, we still live on Earth. <laughs> we still live on this flat concrete world now that we need to be stable. So lots of single leg work, but with good alignment through your um, foot, ankle, knee, tracking over your foot where possible and trying to use your foot and hip muscles to control and stabilize that movement, not locking the knee out or, you know, hyperextending the back to try and get balanced. You want to be balanced with control through the foot and the hip. I think that's a great thing to get people to think of is if you are trying to balance, like just standing on one foot to pay attention to what the hip is doing, to pay attention to what the glutes are doing rather than just mm. focus on the foot. Cause it's easy to think that balance is all on the foot. Um, but obviously there's other components to it. Um, do you know about the old man test? No. So the old man test, I saw it on TikTok in the like first time I ever got on TikTok. Um, you put a pair of shoes and a pair of socks down in front of you, stand on one foot, and while standing on one foot, a sock and then shoe on obviously the other foot, and then switch feet and then put on the shoe and sock or sock and shoe. So I, if you look on um, Facebook or on Inst my, our Instagram, you'll see. So I put on a shoe and a sock and then I took off the shoe and the sock and then I did it again blindfolded. Yeah. Um, now I'm hopping around a little bit. I, I wasn't obviously as stable, but uh, you know, I, I pull it off um, shoe and a sock blindfolded. And it's pretty funny because the first time I, I put on the sock and I kind of hot had to hop around. And when I went to grab the shoe, I put the, I grabbed the wrong shoe and put that on my foot. It was like, the hell that feels weird. Like, oh, okay. I get it. So I haven't even seen with that. Just what's that? Yeah. I haven't seen anyone else do it blindfolded. I was hoping it was going to get more attention, but oh well. be a challenge there. It is a challenge. Um, no one's taking me up on it. With the like what you said about the blindfolding, so that's what I was just saying about being on single leg. Yeah. So you know, once you get stable on single leg, and you might have the arms kind of you know, in the, the upper body kind of trying to you know do things to stabilize you. Once you can be stable, do things like like eventually blindfold yourself or close your eyes, but even just turning your head to the left, you know, slowly yeah. to the right while you're on one leg, up, down, um, moving one hand up. Down uh, to the side, right? Because walking, we're not balanced still walking with our arms kind of like out to the side trying to stabilize us. We need to be able to balance on one leg and be stable while also mobile, mobile on the other side. So when walking, we need stability and mobility, which is why people struggle at walking um, when there's a, a dysfunction because our brain's trying to do two things. We're trying mm -hmm. to swing an arm for counter, you know, rotation, counter balance. We might be looking because someone's talked to us in a certain direction or you know, looking up because it's something's just dropped on our head or something. I don't know. But being stable on one leg whilst being able to move the upper body, breathe yeah. well, good posture, that's kind of the next progression. And those simple things can have such a profound effect on your other training, you know, yeah. whether it's gym training, running, oh. whatever it is you're doing. Oh. Um, it all kind of works on that bigger oh. scale as well. Do you know, do you know Jim Klopman? From the guy, no. so the Slack block that we sell on our site. Have you seen it? No. Oh, you have what to check it? it out. I'll have to get you one. Yeah. Slack block. Basically, it's like it's some of that, you know, um, like uh, aerofoam stuff with a. You have to go look at it. Just look up Slack block on our website. Yeah. And what he does, first of all, 
see, he has a lot of things you were just talking about, but one of them, he'll have you balance on the slack block on one foot, and then he'll throw things at you to catch them. And he's, don't look at it. Just use your peripheral vision, just catch. Mm. And he works mm. with golfers and just doing that with their peripheral vision, suddenly their golf swing improves. And they're like, what just happened? He goes, everything just got more integrated from you having to do these multiple things at one time. And that's going to translate to your golf swing. And they're like, but that had nothing to do with my golf swing. Right. It's huge. Yeah. But this stuff is like, I ran a workshop a couple of years ago. It was before COVID when we were allowed to have people in a room. Yeah. And <laughs> I ran a seniors workshop, right? Because I was seeing at the time in the general practice we have here, like just a lot more falls, you know? I just kind of was seeing these people hearing of falls. And I thought, well, I need to just try something. So I ran this little workshop here. We had about 10 people in the first batch go through. And these people were ranged from 70 to 90, you know? One of these ladies was on a walking frame. Like when I came in for this first session, I had this, you know, plan mapped out of what like I would normally do for people. Like it's <laughs> a little bit intense. And I was just like, okay, I really didn't think, you know, I was going to get that kind of age group, but that's fine. So I, I changed it all up and we did just simple, simple things, just like the toe yoga, like, like we're just saying, like working on single leg balance, holding on. You know, by the end of this, I think we did five weeks from memory, just 40 minutes sessions each week, just going through simple drills. By the um, fifth week, I remember that lady on the walking frame was balancing without the walking frame. She did a lap up and down my clinic without the walking frame and was like, I feel like I keep using it. Like I don't want you to come right. back in and, you know, like, but it was insane. It blew me away by just what you're talking about. We were just doing things like, yeah. um, you know, they had to stand on my leg and just reach and they were passing the ball back and forward to each other, like a tennis ball, simple things like that. It was fun as well. Um, like you mentioned at the start, it needs to be fun. And it would just blew me away how it changed a lot of these people's gait. It's a huge one and um, very misunderstood. I mean, I can't, I'm always amazed when I see some elderly person who has balance issues and a doctor recommends a thicker shoe. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, you need more motion control. No, no, no. Uh, that's a whole thing. Well, I know um, that you got to go. I've used your time. I really appreciate it. Um, how can people find out more about you and what you're doing and get in touch with you? Um, so social media, it's the Barefoot Podiatrist. That's on Instagram and Facebook. Otherwise, my website is thebarefootmovement.com.au. .au. So .com .au. Keep that .au. .au. Yes, and yeah. not just the .com. Well, Paul, this has been a total, total pleasure. Um, I am looking forward to when people are traveling around the world more and we get to see each other live and in person where you'll discover I'm much taller on video than I am in real life. And, and I'm much shorter. <laughs> Perfect. I actually, it's funny you say that. I have one friend, we've never seen each other in person. We've known each other for 20 years. And it wasn't until like two years ago where we, we both discovered we're the same height. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, I never met. I, neither of us ever thought of that. It was like, wow, I pictured you as taller than me. It, me too. So <laughs> perfect. Anyway, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for everyone else, thank you. Uh, once again, head over to not only Paul's site, but uh, if you want to find out more about what's happening with the movement movement, that's www.jointhemovementmovement.com. You'll find previous episodes, all the places you can find the podcast, all of our social media channels, etc. And if you have any questions or suggestions, anyone you think we should have a conversation with, including people who might think I have my head totally up my butt, um, and I've been diagnosed with a case of cranial rectal reorientation syndrome, I'm happy to have that conversation. Hasn't happened yet, but it'd be super fun if it did. But you can drop me an email, move, M-O-V-E, at jointhemovementmovement.com. But most importantly, just go out and have fun and live life feet first. <laughs>